One of our favorite guests, Mike Golick Jr., you can watch his show on DraftKings with his dad. And he's doing all kinds of fun stuff in the world of football and sports, and he joins us once again here. Good afternoon, sir. How the heck are you? Doing well. Appreciate you guys having me, man. How you doing? Uh, we're, oh, doing we're doing good. good. We, uh, we have, uh, some, have breaking some breaking news here. Dalvin, Dalvin Cook, Cook going, going to the to Ravens. The Ravens. Is this a, a good pickup? There was a lot of conversation. Should the Cowboys get him? Uh, you know what? I, I think it's one of those where at this point is Dalvin Cook on his own an overly compelling player? Not really, but in the context that the Ravens can use him in, yeah, that's a, a, a worthwhile add for them. Uh, we know it's a position that obviously depth took a hit uh, earlier this year when Keaton Mitchell got injured. We know that in general, offensive line, the running game there, one of the best in football, having a quarterback like Lamar Jackson makes that a lot easier. And so I think like anything else, these moves look pretty good when you're a team that already has your big needs covered and this is just kind of a supplemental pickup. So uh, works for Baltimore, just like for Dallas, it would have been nice to, I'm sure, have a little bit of depth in that spot there. But uh, it is one of those that I think, especially because of Lamar's legs, makes this a lot more viable and a lot more interesting. How important is is going to be running the ball here in the playoffs? The Cowboys have been getting by with Dak and C.D. Lamb for the majority of it. Are they going to need their running game? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think so. I think the problem with really – for the Cowboys, for anything else, it's like we understand in the NFC side, like this road goes through one place at this point. So, you know, if, if you're Dallas, this is all about like what does it take for you to beat San Francisco? And yeah, absolutely, that's only, that's going to become a factor for Dallas. I, I think that was the most surprising thing for me towards the end of the season was seeing in some of the big time matchups. You know, even going to the Lions game, where I thought going into that one, like all right. Dallas offensive line, Lions offensive line, two of my more you know enjoyable offensive lines to watch in the NFL, competent overall offenses, and that Detroit defense that had been much maligned for a lot of the season, and I think it played better as of late, was really able to limit Dallas's effectiveness up front in a way that surprised me. So, yeah, that's absolutely important. I think anytime you're getting to postseason football, we always say run game travels. In my mind, it's just you got to have options. Like, you can't be just one thing when it gets to the NFL playoffs. So you're going to have a bad time. Assuming they get there, do you think the Cowboys make it to the NFC title game for the first time in nearly 30 years? Man, I I would, I would have to say so. Like, just looking around at the rest of the NFC playoff picture and what else is there, my biggest – my biggest worry for them at this point, my biggest worry for anybody in the NFC playoffs is going to be the Los Angeles Rams. Like that is a terrifying fun to the point we talked about before complete football team. That's got a healthy quarterback an offensive line. That's been taking names and kicking, you know what, and getting ready to go. So I think it's tight. I mean, Detroit, obviously, as we just recently saw in a close game that, you know, Detroit lions fans would have gripes about officiating with, you know, you Dallas, you made the plays. You, you kept it competitive. You made the plays and ultimately got the game won. But uh, Detroit Lions would absolutely worry me, given the way they've played now that their offensive line is a bit whole again. We saw the areas where they struggled where you had to mix up that group because of injury in front of them, and all of a sudden Jared Goff wasn't afforded the same level of protection. Mike, the thing that I – you know, and I, I've been taking a beating on Twitter uh, talking to folks because people ask me, who do you not want to play? And I bring up the Rams. And everybody reminds me about the game they had against the Giants last week. And then I remind them of the game that the Rams had against the Ravens. I haven't seen the Ravens other than the Browns. I haven't seen anybody play the Ravens like the Rams and the Browns did. And so people are like, well, they almost lost to the Giants. I, I don't care. You're, everything you said about that football team is absolutely right about them. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, we can all – but this is the NFL. Like, of course they played a close game. I get the sure. Giants aren't world beaters right now, but the Cardinals just beat the Eagles last right. week. Like, this is that kind of league, and I get it. You know, Kyler Murray being back is a lot different than the Cardinals team that beat the Dallas Cowboys earlier in this season. But, yeah, I I'm with you. I, I always just look at what are the, the traits about the football team yeah. that would worry you there. And to your point, while I think some of that's matchup specific, certainly to the Baltimore Ravens, if I'm Dallas, we've seen what it looks like when someone could just line up and run the pill right down your throat. That's right. still the area that's been the weakness for this Cowboys defense this year. Uh, you know, unfortunately, certain additions have not made that thing go away. And yeah, right now, the Rams have what the Eagles had last year, which is the formula can be really simple. When you can line up, just run duo and hand the ball off, everything else gets a lot easier. And then you have talented quarterbacks in both situations on top of it.
who's the team you trust most in the AFC after Baltimore? After You know what is interesting is for all the issues they've had, there's part of me that still wants to default to Pat and Andy because, hell, the Chiefs have been the team that know this time of year and can navigate it as well as anybody. Uh, I would probably say besides that, honestly, the Cleveland Browns. Mm. Like, it, Joe Flacco, you wa- keep wondering if eventually the carriage is going to turn back into a pumpkin and if him falling asleep on the sideline and all that funny stuff there is eventually going to give way to more games with multiple interceptions like we saw a couple of weeks ago. But I, I still look at the defense. It's a war machine. Like, outside, if if there were not the Baltimore Ravens defense this year, we would probably spend a lot more time talking about Miles Garrett's likely defensive player of the year campaign, the way that he's looked, that, you know, uh, Ward's looked in that uh, defensive backfield, Jeremiah Wusu koromoa what a weapon he is, a mm-hmm. linebacker, and the job that Jim Schwartz has done. So I, I would say they're right up there. And I think in we- recent weeks now, we've seen it's readily apparent. They're not going to sneak up on anybody now. It's Mike Golick Jr. here with you on the fan. I'm ready for Joe Flacco to be remembered as a Brown more than a Raven. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder what the – I. I, I I would give a lot to see a Ravens Browns rematch or I said matchup in like the AFC championship yeah. game for that reason, as much as any. And I saw a bunch of videos came to light about Joe Flacco and for all the talk that he gets about how kind of prickly it felt at the beginning when Lamar got there and how people felt like Joe kind of fought that there was great footage of him on the sideline, helping Lamar go through some stuff. I'm sure that's a guy that does mean something to Lamar in terms of football development and means a lot to that Ravens organization that now just came off the shelf and is kind of playing with the reckless abandon of someone who's too rich for the job. Like he's got money. He doesn't need this. He's just doing this for fun. And he understands it's all house money. And that guy is playing football like that. Like this is not just Joe Flacco game manager out there. I remember that game. They lost speaking of the Rams game. They ultimately ended up losing but i remember talking to me at times at espn after that i was like joe flacco kind of had some throws in this game right like i'm not crazy he was kind of sidewinding some stuff i didn't realize he had it like that and this just feels like a guy that's playing loose was that your team as a kid cleveland now i grew up an eagles fan dad spent six years there so i grew up uh you know i know i'm saying that right now a company that might not appreciate that if it's any consolation now (laughs) i am pretty agnostic at this point and because i'm a big zach martin fan got to play with him i obviously spent a a lot of my time hoping he does well but yeah i grew up on the other side of the tracks on this one dad spent so much time there I caught the Andy Reid years in Philadelphia. Yeah. So life was pretty good there for a while. And then by the time I made the trip to try and play in the NFL, everybody either cut me or didn't sign me. So I was like, all right, <laughs> forget y'all. I'll just root for my friends. <laughs> I love it. Mike Golick Jr. here. So when, when, other than Notre Dame, do you have rooting interest in sports? Nope. And I keep it real. So, and honestly, that's a mistake. Fandom mm. is a mistake. What a poison I've allowed into my life. Mm. Every fall, I give myself over to Notre Dame, and I get ready to get hurt again, and then I watch them break me over their leg almost every time. I love that school more than life itself. I loved being a football player there. But every fall, when I'm on there on Saturday and I'm getting ready to call a game somewhere else, and I'm sitting in a – yeah. the, the, truth, the true story, Notre Dame was playing um, BYU in Las Vegas last year, and – I was calling a game at NC State, and it lined up so halftime of our game, I could go down and watch them in the Notre Dame game. It was on in the press box, and I'm sitting there eating hot dogs and pot stickers in the NC State press box, and it is a press box, so it's not that loud. Notre Dame was winning, everything was good, and then all of a sudden they threw a red zone interception, and my body just knee-jerked, slammed the table, (laughs) shouted the F word, and then looked around at the rest of my crew and go, all right, I'm going to go back upstairs because I can't do this right now. So that is, uh, yeah, that's the one thing I am responsible enough to be a fan of, and even that's a stretch. The rabid nature of college football fandom. Which one were you more impressed with, the the Ohio State contingent that went to the Rose Bowl to just hate watch Michigan or the Texas fan slash father who was berating Washington players at the end of uh, Texas taking that L? I'm going to go neither. I'm going to go off the board player hate of the year. I forget his name, and I wish I did. The Oklahoma D lineman that was on the All-State Good Works team at the Sugar Bowl that came out there at halftime to receive the award for being a valued member of his community. Like, I was, you know, humble brag, I was on the All-State Good Works team when I was in college. Yes. And you get that for doing community service and being a generally likable person around the program. And this dude came in his moment. 
at Texas's game and went out there at halftime and threw the horns down the entire time. That has to be the first time that the Allstate Good Works team has gotten booed. And not just a little booed. It got booed like NHL commissioner. It got booed like Roger Goodell boos in that game. So he's player hater of the year going forward as far as I'm concerned. That is pretty good. And our, our resident Sooner fan here in the building, Carter, just texted me. Ethan Downs is the, uh, yes. the, the gentleman there. So... Uh, well, did, at any point during the college football playoff, did you find yourself wishing that you were watching the Seminoles? Uh, you know what? I, I I had done that pretty much the entire time because I maintained they should have been in there. And anyone that wanted to use the results of the Orange Bowl with a basically completely different team to try and relitigate that outcome, that's ridiculous. That's not how this works. We know that wasn't the same team, even though either way they weren't going to have Jordan Travis out there. So uh, it wasn't one of those, like, the games were good. Of course we weren't going to, like, sit there and be wanting for anybody. I still think Florida State should have gotten in, but I can also look and say and appreciate we got two incredible games. We're in line for another incredible game. The committee was always going to win because college football – in general, most of the decisions being made right now are dictated by good TV ratings, and they got them. And we knew they were going to get them in this matchup. So uh, I didn't find myself wanting, but I still believed in my heart that Florida State should have been there. Hey, Mike, we learned last week that uh, Zach, uh, he told us he was the MVP of the Pinstripe Bowl, and he took his MVP trophy, and it ended up in the bottom of a lake somewhere in Indiana. It, 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 have you ever heard that story before, or were you part of the story? <laughs> I have not heard that story. So Zach, Zach's pinstripe bowl MVP came the year after I left. Okay. And so I was not party to that one, but that is the least surprising thing in the world. I I, I would have been like, he, he made it sound like that initially he's like, oh, I've got a story about my MVP trophy. And I was thinking he probably traded it for a case of beer or some burgers, you know, some food. And he's like, listen, I can't pay, but here, here's my trophy. Would you please give me a, a case of beer and all that? But he said, no, it got knocked into the lake and nobody, nobody went after. So it's sitting in the bottom of some lake right now. Just not surprising. I do love enough. that. I love that in contrast. And it, it speaks to everything about Zach Martin that you look and what photo went viral the other day. Yeah. It was Caleb Williams in his Los Angeles penthouse. Mm -hmm. And in the background, you could see the Heisman Trophy perched over by the window. So you've got Caleb Williams on one side, a star <laughs> quarterback doing that. And then Zach Martin, Indiana's finest, with a trophy from a bowl game at the Pinstripe Bowl lodged in the bottom of the lake. Those are pr tremendously on brand. Mike, I want to ask you this. Are, are With the playoffs coming around, are coaches still going to be as reckless as they are the way they're managing these games? Does, does, does a, a switch flip uh, on that about not being as reckless in playoffs as they are in the regular season? I, I think, you know, it depends on what your definition of reckless is. Like if it's mismanaging certain situations yeah. clockwise, yeah. i.e. that unfortunately comes up with, you know, Mike McCarthy a little more often than people would like. I, I think that's something that, only lends itself more to this because that to me, and like, I, I understand we all sit here as fans and criticize mm -hmm. all that. And people, I you know, said, someone asked me the day, people that work in sports, how does this happen so yeah. often? Those sidelines are incredibly chaotic. Chaos. You are trying to balance a lot and be good at a ton of things. And I, I understand, yes, it's part of the job. Yes, they're extremely well paid. But when it pops up every so often, I'm not all that stunned outside of a few obvious moments. So I think some of those will still come up. And I think a lot of them come up now and will look even that way because we've got more coaches inclined mm -hmm. to take risks. I mean, hell, look at the Dallas and the Lions yeah. game. Even after the gaffe that went on in the two-point play and the would they did they or didn't they report with the officials – Dan Campbell got backed up and still said, bleep it. I'm yeah. going for two again here. Yeah. Like when you get coaches that are wired that way, either because they are analytically inclined, see the Baltimore Ravens, or because they've just got the manalytics of Dan Campbell, mm. they're going to be more situations and like high that. leverage spots where mm. this pops up. And so, yeah, I'd imagine this is something we'll keep seeing from a majority of coaches. Other coaches we know can turtle up in big moments, especially in the postseason, devolve to more conservative football. But I hope we're past that because I like fun. We've talked a lot about Dan. He's from just down the road. Would you want to play for him or would you be like, man, he's going to lose us this game. We're going to drive it down there. We should be going to OT. And he just pulled Manalytics again. No, I, I'd be all for that because in my mind, the analytics conversation has always been like improperly framed. It's people saying, oh, look what the nerds came in and did. It's like, no, nah, I, I want the coach to... Like, 
John Harbaugh and Lamar Jackson are the perfect example because we love those little back and forths where it's Lamar going over and saying, mm. we want to go for it. We mm. want to go for it. And John's like, yeah, go for it. When in reality, like the analytics guy was probably in John's. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is go territory. We're absolutely good <laughs> to go here. But you know what? Go ahead and do the thing because John understands people and he understands pushing the buttons like that. And I always think having a coach that would rather go out and win it. These are high-level competitors. These are alpha males. They want to go out there and they want to try and take what they believe is theirs in this spot. And I've always thought the notion of conservative football that was considered the old school way kind of ran counter to that. So, no, I would love that. And especially when you know that's your MO and that's your identity, you're never surprised by it. I think Michigan's a great example of that this last weekend in college football. That fourth down decision, that wasn't a surprise to them because you go back and look at all of the big games, Ohio State and Penn State that Michigan had played. Even when Jim Harbaugh was out and Sharon Moore was the interim head coach, They were going for it in those spots. They feared nothing, and that trickles down. You take your cues from the head man and how that approach and that attitude in those situations is set. And so, no, I'd love that. Golic Jr. with us on fire as always. We're keeping you late. If you got to go, just hang up on us. But I do got to know, are you going to be hate watching the natty? No? (laughs) I am definitely going to be watching the natty. You know what? It's interesting. I was thinking about this because obviously, yeah, being a Notre Dame fan, I did not grow up feeling very good feelings about Michigan. As I've gotten older, unfortunately, what happens is familiarity breeds comfort. I went to Ann Arbor for the first time, not as a player last year, to cover a game. And I hated it because it was a lovely college town and it was a beautiful campus. And I actually had a really good time there. (laughs) And I do appreciate what they've done. The interesting part about some of the feelings there is when you watch Georgia, when you watch Ohio State, when you watch Alabama, you see these death stars creating by incredible recruiting prowess over years and years. You know, the last time Georgia didn't have a top five recruiting class? 2016, Mm -hmm. the first year Kirby got there. They've been a top five recruiting class every year since that. I know we can't replicate that at Notre Dame. Mm. That's not something that I think is realistic given the constraints of the sports right now. But what Michigan's done is, and you look at that and you go, all right, if they were able to do it, why not us? And there is part of that that inspires some semblance of hope, both in style of play and in roster makeup. That All right, while it might be a one-off and we could go back next year, even though an expanded playoff to being dominated by talent-rich people – in the transfer portal era with all the volatility in the sport right now, if you're a program that is still capable of developing and you hit it at the right time, you've got the veterans in the right pieces and you have that one year, it can still be possible to get over even in a sport that's largely been smart, star dominant. You got to get that, uh, that donation box at the grotta, you know, that thing you got to get, you know, <laughs> let's, let's get that going. Why not? Huh? I've been tossing tenors in there for Jesus for a while. It says three dollars. I go a little bit of extra to try and curry some favor with the Lord. I, you know what? Hopefully, just slide that one on over. Let the Lord there take we the go. tide. I yeah. think it's twenty percent, and yeah. then let's we'll put the other eighty towards some guys that can rush the passer. We, we catch need, the football. Let's pass the plate a little often there at, at <laughs> South Bend. Get Gojo a damn pass rusher, please. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that, that's Amen. awesome. Amen. We'll, we'll see you in Vegas. Awesome. Can't wait, fellas. Have a good one.